Welcome to On Software. Conversations with thought leaders in software development. Brought to you by A lot of times, switching tacks just a little bit, you mentioned you know, coming into your Agile team. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times when you hear people talking about Agile teams, when you hear people talking about, like for example, the original XP team at, at mm -hmm. Chrysler and so forth, uh, they're talking about relatively small teams. Right. Right. And then you walk into some of these Fortune 500 companies where they've got like a Anderson or an Accenture <coughs> or you know, Ernst & Young or whatnot, and they have these 50, 100, 200 man teams working on some large system. Right. Um, is that just a precursor to failure? Does an agile team have to be less than a dozen people, less than a half dozen people? You know, how well does this, does this notion of agility in large project space, user stories in large project space, how well do these go together? Right. Well, there's a real danger in a lot of the Agile books, and it's very tempting to write this way, to describe Agile for a lone team on a desert island, right? Our, mm -hmm. our little seven or eight person team on a desert island. And it's, it's a great way to explain some things, right? You know, here's how it works. But then you have to make sure that if you're, if you're writing a book or an article on Agile that you explain, well, that's not all there is. Here's the other things that have to happen. Right. And one of right. the things that Agile authors, the very beginning did, the earliest Agile books, the 99 to 2001 or so books did, was really stress that, hey, here's the context I've used this on. And right. they were small projects. And now somebody these days comes along, reads that book and says, oh, it's only useful on small projects. Right. And right. no, it was just more the, uh, the honesty of the authors writing the book saying, hey, I've used this on five and 10 and 20 person teams, no bigger, right? Go try it if you want and let me know how it goes. That was right. the attitude at the time. And we've since learned that Agile scales up very well. I was uh, with a company last week that is uh, embarking on a 700 person Agile project. Now they're not going to have 700 people in one room, one team. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be 100 teams, it might be 80 teams, but it'll be a lot of teams that have to coordinate their work rather than one 700 person team. So how do you scale it up? I mean, just in a nutshell, how do you take a, a, a 700 person project and run it as a hundred teams of seven without having five levels of management in between the guy in charge of the whole thing and the individual programmers. We're not going to, you know, you, I'm going to start out with the, with the, with the assumption there, uh, the guy in charge of the whole thing, right? There really is no the guy in charge of the whole, the whole okay. thing. There is probably somebody with the overall vision, somebody establishing a vision for what we need. Um, I like the scrum terms for most of these things. I would be somebody called a product owner. On okay. a big project like that, we'd probably call them a chief product owner. Different companies will have different names for this. Um, I just like chief product owner is the most generic of these. Um, that person has the overall vision. What are we trying to establish? They're going to have to pass that vision down to, uh, to teams, uh, sub-teams in ways. Mm -hmm. And they'll do that. So there'll be typically a hierarchy that understands the vision there. Um, let's just use Microsoft Office as a wonderful example because it's such okay. a product everybody understands. So we'd have a visionary that understands where are we going with, with Office. And then underneath there, there might be what we'll call a wine product owner. Wine product owner might own PowerPoint, another wine product owner would own Excel, another for Word, something like that. Okay. Uh, those people then have a vision for what needs to go in those products. They'll have product owners underneath them. So these people are not running the project, they're just kind of the, the person with the vision. We're going to scale that up by having teams associated down those same hierarchies. Mm -hmm. um, but the teams coordinate their work in ways that they determine. Uh, I really like the, uh, the very first article on Scrum came out in 1986. Scrum's one of the Agile processes. And it talks about that teams need three things from the company. Okay. It said they need money, moral support, and guidance. I need money, need to get paid, things sure. like that. Sure. Need moral support, you know, encouragement when things are going poorly, things like that. Um, and we need guidance. So that's what these product owners are there to do, provide guidance. Well, I want this feature, or I prefer this over that, that type okay. of setup. All right. We scale the project up by then, uh, setting up different teams, giving them these guidance, say going after these, these features. But agile teams on their own are not enough. I like to think of the agile teams as being vertically aligned. I want to take some kind of cross-cutting dimensions across those teams. Sure. I don't want to have a 700 person team with, let's say 400 programmers, and the programmers never talk. So right. I want to set up some orthogonal right. teaming structures across there and say, hey, 400 programmers, go talk sometime. Right. right? And that'll be some responsibility for the line manager. Maybe there's a, a 
technology director who runs that 400 person group. Make sure they're talking, doing things in standard ways. It's almost like organizing a small conference with 400 programmers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's got, that's got to be a fairly intimidating idea of trying to get 400 people to talk to one another, you know, about whatever, about, mm -hmm. you know, language or, or feature or whatnot. I mean, how do you encourage that kind of communication? Uh, well, it can be it can be established formally. It can be done informally. However, is appropriate for the project, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're using the 700 example because that's where I happen to be last week, right? More realistically, we'd be probably be talking about an agile team that's scaling up in the one to three, four hundred range. Okay. I mean, those are much more common. And you might be talking 50, 60, 70 programmers. Um, even them, they may split into two categories real easily, right? We've got client side, server side. So I don't necessarily have to have all 400 talking to each other, right? Okay. So right. It's, you know, it's the typical challenges that faced a, a typical development director or VP of development with a, a medium to large group. So you mentioned that you've done two books, and we've been talking about user stories. Uh, estimating and planning, yes. right? Once I've got my stories in place. I mean, this has always, to me, been the hardest part of any programming job. Yep. You know, your boss comes to you and says, we, here's here's what you need to do. How long will it take you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just in a nutshell, right? Give me give me like the the two sentence uh, story around agile estimating and planning. How do you do it? <laughs> in two sentences. In two sentences. No uh, more than that. So I don't have to buy the book. Right. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> Uh, two sentences. I would say that, uh, I don't know if I'll have exactly two, but the, the idea for me is to estimate software projects in the way that we estimate real world activities. And okay. to do that, uh, the best example of that is that we, we estimate the size of something, and then we think about how fast we can do that thing, and then we convert the t we can put those two together to come up with the duration. So let's suppose that we were to drive from uh, here in San Jose today, and we wanted to drive to uh, Austin, Texas. Well, we okay. might think about that. If we had to estimate that drive, we'd kind of visualize a map, think about that. I have no idea how far that is. I'm just going to make up some easy math in my head. Let's say it's 1,200 miles, right? We would think okay. about it being 1,200 miles. Then we'd think about our pace. Say, well, I bet I go 60 miles an hour on average, right? I got to stop every now and then. I'm also going to be going 70 during those empty right. parts of Texas. Or 80 or 90. Well, I'm not going to say that on tape. <laughs> I'm going to go 60, maybe 70. And uh, I'm going to divide the 1,200 miles then by the 60 miles an hour. Come up with around 20 hours is my estimate. That's a real world best practice way to estimate. Estimate the size of something and drive the duration. So when uh, I want teams to estimate on, on software projects, I don't want them to go to the first principles question of how long will this take, right? How long will it take to add tables to a word processor, again, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I want to think about how big it is, right? What is the size of this task compared to others? Right? And so, for example, let's estimate a word processor right now, something I don't think either of us have worked on. Nope. So if, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, if we think about uh, putting bold text into a word processor, well, I don't know how long that'll take, but I bet it'll take the same amount of time as italicizing text does okay. inside of a word processor. So I'd put that same type of number on there. So I want to put these relative estimates on there rather than absolute estimates that, that mean a time unit. So we go through an uh, entire list of features to be added. Uh, call that a product backlog typically on an Agile project, okay. would estimate the size of things. So now I'd have all these relatively uh, valid but somewhat meaningless numbers. Now, this one's a five, this one's a 20. All that means is it takes four times longer. Right. And then we'd get started. We'd so these aren't necessarily in hours, they're just abstract Absolutely. Bars. Absolutely. Okay. The, so I've seen teams estimate them in what they, they'll call them gummy bears. I've seen teams call them uh, Cheez-Its. Uh, just, you know, they, they called it Cheez-Its based on like the number of boxes of Cheez-Its that they thought one of their main developers would eat in a particular day uh, or while doing that feature. So they'll be meaningless units, but they're, they're relatively valid. The 20 is about four times as big as a five. Mm -hmm. A one is a fifth of a five. And teams will add these up and say, well, we have a thousand points to do mm -hmm. or a thousand Cheez-Its to do. Now, no idea how long that's going to take yet. Right. But then we right. get started on the project. We run the project for a couple of weeks see how far we've got done. And then we can take that pace that we're getting done and divide it into the, uh, the total size of the project. It starts to give us some predictability. That's, that's far more than two sentences, but that's well, a but simple it's, version it's, of it. The, where it gets harder is where teams have to estimate before they've started. Right? There are right. times if we're doing a contract, right. for example, I can't let the team get started for two weeks. Right? I have to estimate before I do that. That you're gonna have to buy the book for. I, mean, I can tell you, but that'll be that'll be that'll be harder to fit into. Two that's sentences. the tease. That's the plan. Yeah, that's the tease. Okay. There, there are ways to do that. So this is not valid only when you have an existing team 
that's already run a little bit. Um, there are ways to do it uh, even without that, but they're, they're harder to explain. For more information, visit onpodcastweekly.com and subscribe to all our podcasts. Brought to you by the publishing imprints and information portal of Pearson Education.